Okay, I want to welcome everybody for uh, joining this evening on our uh, 2020, and I, I realize it's 2021, but uh, our 2020 Virtual Missouri Livestock Symposium. Uh, tonight we have with us, uh, again, uh, presenting for us is Dr. Larry Holler. Dr. Larry Holler uh, specializes in diagnostic pathology at South Dakota State University. He received uh, bachelor's and DVM degrees from Kansas State University and later a PhD from Washington State University. Uh, Dr. Holler's professional emphasis include uh, reproductive pathology, reproductive wastage in livestock, mastitis, small ruminant production and related diseases and genetic diseases of animals. Uh, Dr. Holler is gonna talk to us tonight about uh, why cattle abort in a talk that is titled Trends in Bovine Reproductive Wastage. Dr. Holler, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, I, know it's, I know it's really cold in South Dakota as it is here in Northeast Missouri, but uh, uh, we sure do appreciate you joining us this evening and uh, sharing what you have to share with us. So uh, I'll kind of stop sharing my screen and uh, let you share yours, and uh, then we'll do uh, some Q&A. Just real quick, before I turn it over to Dr. Holler, if you have questions as we go along, please use your chat function of the Zoom. Uh, I'll be monitoring those, and we'll do a little Q&A uh, when Dr. Holler wraps up his presentation. So, Dr. Holler, I'll give you the floor. Uh, so, you know, putting this talk together, you know, basically trends in bovine reproductive wastage, um, you know, I almost ended up with two different talks. You know, I do abortion diagnosis uh, essentially as a, this time of year is primary, my primary duty. Um, I'll get 20 or 30 cases of reproductive wastage in every week. Um, you know, I'll have to work them, try to come up with answers for, for veterinarians and producers. Uh, abortions, it's basically a season. Um, you know, and often times, you know, it's a difficult challenge to find answers. I think I'll go, as we go through this, you'll, you'll better understand all the steps and maybe come away with a few uh, things you can do to improve the odds of, uh, you know, actually coming up with a diagnosis. Uh, let us see here. I guess uh, I need to shut that off. Um, I was actually, uh, after graduating uh, from veterinary school at Kansas State, I actually was in practice in Lebanon, Missouri for a couple of years uh, before I kind of ended up wandering across the state on my way to Washington State for my PhD. Um, some quick definitions. Uh, and, and what I want you to look at this list and, and think about it as a continuum. Abortion, you know, expulsion of a fetus prior to viability of stillbirth, fully formed but yet dead fetus, and then weak born, live but non-viable fetus. Basically, for the most part, these are often times a continuum of a process uh, in a herd. You know, it may start off, you may start seeing some abortions and as, as calving comes closer, you may see some stillbirths. And then as you're already into calving, you may see weak born animals. It can all be and often is a continuum of the same process. Uh, embryonic death, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. It probably is, happens a lot more often than we think. Um, humans and some species, 15 to 30 percent. So these are, the, these, are the, these are the cows that come open, you know, don't know why. Um, just, just you thought they were bred at one time. Um, a lot of times people think there's lots of potential chromosomal problems, genetic problems. Uh, viruses, drugs, radiation, most of the time you just don't know. These are the cows that show up open. Um, risk factors, um, back to kind of the, the flip on why cows abort, you know, really why, how do, how do they ever have 
live calves, uh, the fetus is really kind of at risk. When it's sitting in that uterus, it's isolated from most of the maternal immune system, kind of operates in an, uh, in an environment of decreased oxygen concentration. So every bit of oxygen that fetus gets is going to get through the placenta. Uh, it's, it's kind of a nice, like it, it's a really nice warm environment, elevated temperatures. But when you think about growing infectious agents, that is a primary good temperature to grow stuff. Slow immune and inflammatory responses, fetal fluids, that fetus is sitting there swimming in a bacterial culture media. So um, there's a lot of, lot of things stacked against the fetus. Um, you know, the corpus luteum on the ovary provides progesterone, uh, primarily early, early gestation. If that uh, CL uh, somehow is lysed, so if, like if you were to give the cow prostaglandin, that's, that's how you abort a cow. The fetus will be expelled uh, relatively quickly um, for the most part. Uh, if the CL stays intact, but the fetus dies, um, often if it's a small early gestational uh, pregnancy, it'll be resorbed. Sometimes it'll just be, if it's, there's no infectious process involved, it can be turned into a mummy. Um, mummification, probably not as common in cattle as uh, other species such as uh, sheep and goats but, and pigs, but we do see mummific mummification in cattle. Um, usually fetal death after you've got enough fetus that it's hard to absorb. So after you've started uh, calcification of the skeletal system, it's, it's hard for that body to, or for that cow to absorb that fetus. Whoops. Um, usually, you know, you've still got a CL intact and there's no bacterial infection. You know, as long as it's kind of a sterile environment, that fetus will just sit there uh, the fluids will leave it and, you know, that fetus can, uh, that mummified fetus can actually stay in there a long time. Uh, sometimes they, you know, you'll, you'll be looking at cows going through a kill plant and you'll find a mummified fetus in the uterus when they, you know, kill that cow. Uh, maceration, basically that's the dead fetus in the presence of a, of an infectious process. The fetus these are the really nasty fetuses, um, usually venereal infections, uh, common in things like trichomoniasis or uh, venereal campylobacter infections. Uh, pyometra endometritis, basically big words for a uterine infection. Um, during the last trimester of pregnancy requires participation for the fetus. So fetal hormonal support um, is required to maintain the pregnancy. If that fetus dies in that last little bit, um, you know, that fetus usually will be expelled uh, within, a, within a certain amount of time. Often, um, depending on whether there's a lot of bacteria growing in there, you know, the fetus will be variably autolyzed. Autolyzed is a nice big word for rotten. Uh, a lot of what I deal with has a certain amount of uh, deterioration to it. And so that makes actually a lot of uh, work under the microscope difficult. Uh, so there'll be tissues will be pale, they'll be soft, they'll be blood stained. Um, those of you that have cattle and have had abortions kind of know what they look like. So it's, it's not, uh, not a lot different. Um, kind of threw this up just to give you kind of a clue you know, cats and dogs and, you know, the last three are kind of, you know, if you kind of get the small dog, medium dog, large dog, you've got that six, seven, eight month. You know, so if you're, if you're seeing fetuses like that, you can kind of guess. Uh, for the most part, a lot of folks are, do, do pretty good jobs at, uh, you know, have, have better, better than average breeding dates so they can kind of use these guidelines to, get pretty close where they're at for their fetal age. Oh, that's a good slide. All right.
Um, so pathogenesis, this is kind of how abortion diseases happen in the body. Often venereal infections. So these are, these are infections, ascending infections uh, through the, the vaginal vault into the uterus. Um, you know, this would be your, your, your venereal diseases like uh, trichomoniasis or campylobacter. Another one of uh, kind of throw into this category, I didn't actually list it. Oftentimes, you know, there can be some uh, damage or pressure that causes the cervix uh, to prematurely start to relax. It may not be relaxed enough to get a fetus out, but it, a, you know, it opens up, and so it's a it's a route for kind of boring bacteria that normally live in the vaginal vault to sometimes penetrate the the cervix. So basically, an ascending infection. Hematogenous is probably one of the more common routes. Uh, bacteria, viruses, fungus, you name it, they can get into the bloodstream a variety of ways. Um, you can have organisms that would be in the, the GI tract, and the GI tract is notoriously leaky. Uh, bacteria gain access to the bloodstream, uh, travel uh, through the bloodstream to the placenta, uh, and start doing damage. Um, we'll talk here in a few moments uh, about some really kind of boring bacteria and fungal agents that use this route. Uh, these are these aren't really exciting things, but to be honest, they're they're what we currently deal with the most commonly. Um, indirect causes of abortion. These are the you know, these are the sick cow. You know the bacterial infections in the cow. The cow with mastitis. The cow with a bad pneumonia. Uh, you know those are called basically indirect abortions. The cow's sick and then, oh, by the way, the, the fetus is gonna, is gonna check out just because it's, you know, the cow is so sick. Um, all right, I think we, so basically, I, right, we did that one already. Um, when I talked earlier in the pre earlier presentation about uh, sheep abortion, the reality is that the, the there's risk factors from the fetus. You know, it's kind of a rough environment, good bacterial culture media. The maternal risk factor that is constantly pregnant or present in pregnancy is immunosuppression. If you think about that pregnancy, the genetic makeup of that calf is 50% from the bull. And so in order for that fetus to not be recognized as foreign, the immune system of, of that cow is downregulated. And so basically that's a big word, downregulated means she's just, her immune system's not functioning on all cylinders. She in, intentionally downregulates, she intentionally blocks some of her own immune function. Well, the, the basic response to all those decreased function is that all of a sudden she's more susceptible to infectious agents. So it's, it, it, it occurs naturally in order to help the fetus survive, but then it also indirectly makes the fetus more susceptible uh, to different infectious agents. Uh, risk factors, obviously there's nutritional you know, issues, stress, concurrent disease, feed quality. Um, in my line of work, sometimes these are, they, these are really tough uh, factors to get your hands around. Um, you know, I'm not out on, on every producer's farm. I have no idea what their nutritional program is. You know, stress, maybe I can guess, you know, if I'm stressed walking to my car from the cold, well, maybe the cow's a little stressed too. Concurrent disease, you know, a lot of these things feed quality. Um, I, I don't remember the last time I asked a producer, you know, 
how's the feed quality? What are you feeding? And it, the answer is, oh yeah, it's great, doc. And then you start asking, you know, is there any mold in that hay? Oh yeah, we got a little bit of mold. You got round bales? Oh yeah, we feed round bales. Are they stored on the ground? Yeah, we store them outside. How much of the bottom of the bale is decomposed? You know, well, three, four inches, just like everybody else. Well, that, that feed quality, those issues, I'll, I'll show you in here in a moment, that actually kind of is, uh, is playing a big part in a lot of the abortion diseases we see now. Um, deal with this all the time on the phone, you know, bovine abortion, how many is too many? Well, the reality is probably 0% abortion rate while it's a noble goal, it is probably probably not possible unless you maybe have two cows, maybe three cows, you can pull it off. Uh, if you've got 200 cow herd, you're going to have some abortions. When do you submit to the lab? Um, I, that answer has escaped me all these years. Some producers panic at the first abortion. Other producers, uh, you know, have a really tall, strong uh, threshold of pain. You know, they may be at 10% abortions and, you know, just, just starting to get interested. Um, herd histories, you know, the, as producers, I don't know if there's any veterinarians on, but as producers, you know, you need to you know, make sure this information gets uh, to the laboratory. Vaccination programs, purchases, nutrition, any of these factors that could weigh in on uh, reproductive failure. Um, you know, contrary to what everyone would like, it's uh, the work I do is not free. And so it behooves the veterinarian and the producers, uh, you know, to submit the highest quality material they can get. Now, that being said, you know, there's there's always challenges. The, the fetus may be already three-fourths rotten. Uh, the cow ate the placenta. The, you know, she's got the placenta hanging out the back, and I don't want to go chase her down across the pasture in 20 below zero weather. Uh, there's, you know, but it, it, it is in your best interest financially to submit the, you know, the highest quality uh, materials you can. So basically, I deal with intact fetuses, or uh, the best sample is actually an intact fetus and a placenta. Now, obviously, you know somebody in Missouri is going to get a little pricey to pack a a fetus up in a great big styrofoam cooler and ship it all the way to South Dakota. But believe it or not, I get fetuses shipped in big styrofoam containers from all over the country. So it's it's obviously doable. Uh, a lot of times the veterinarian will collect the pieces parts. Um, you know, there's a list there that you know, they, they need to collect. Um, the, the most important sample on that list, while they're all they're all necessary, the most important one is the placenta. Uh, I'll probably harp on that a little bit as we go along. Uh, serology, we do some serologic profiling um, for abortion cases. What I mean by serologic profiling is I don't like working with just one, you know, with one sample from one cow. I don't really like working with paired serum samples from one cow. Uh, what I normally do if I'm doing serology and abortion workups is I'll, we'll bleed a whole group, say if there's five or six cows in the herd that have aborted, we'll bleed those. We'll compare them to five or six cows that we know are still pregnant, and then we will compare the results and see if there's any differences uh, between the abortion group and the still pregnant group. Ear notching, we don't do as much ear notching as, as we used to. Ear notch is a, basically a little chunk of ear that we uh, test for the presence of BVD virus. 
Um, can't stress it. Told you I would stress it all the time. The placenta is by far the most important tissue in a bovine abortion workup. Um, oftentimes, it is the only tissue that I will see lesions. Uh, the slide on the left, see all the little purple staining, the darker purple staining stuff? Uh, that's that's the placentitis. That's the damaged, you know, damaged, dying placenta. That purple, the purple areas. Uh, the reality is, I don't often see any other changes in the fetus. The fetus may be absolutely normal, but uh, all that tissue damage is present in the placenta. Look on the the actual placenta on the right. I mean, you can see grossly. Uh, those those uh, buttons, those cotyledons, how dark and black, and then some of them are really pale and white. The, the pale ones are are already dead uh, areas of placenta. The you know the dark black is is getting there rapidly. So diagnostic success. I, I do a lot of cases of just the fetus, but the, but the reality is I'm guessing my success is cut in half, if not more. Uh, so think about that when you've had the cow abort and she's out there with the placenta hanging out the back and you can't really decide if she's worth catching to go get it. Uh, you know, the, it, the, it, if you want the best value for your diagnostic dollar, go get it. Um, Non-infectious abortion not really i mean we deal with it but we don't deal with it it's often it's often a matter of history um you know if you've got the cow herds running in a whole grove of ponderosa pine out in western south dakota well maybe it's pine needle abortion moldy sweet clover nitri high nitrate wheat uh or oats oats hay um environmental stress trauma the whole list. Oftentimes, you figure most of these out from histories. Genetic diseases, we get a lot of a lot of people wanting. I have kind of an expertise in both reproductive failure, and I also do quite a bit of genetic disease work. Um, people want to send me, you know, two-headed calves and pretty much every weird variation of of fetal anomalies. Uh, the reality is, for the most time, most other than characterizing what's going on, you kind of end up with, yeah, it's one of them, one of them genetic things, because you you know often don't have a, a defined uh, answer for what genetic condition it is. There are a few characterized conditions in certain breeds that we deal with. But to be honest, the breed associations are, are quicker at diagnosing those than we are. Uh, bacteria, pretty much the whole list. Truparella pyogenes is kind of, a, it's had a dozen different names over the last 25 years. Um, this is the bug whenever a cow makes, forms an abscess, this is the bug. And so any kind of an abscess or a dirty needle, this bug has a tendency to get into the bloodstream. And if that cow's pregnant, it'll wander to the placenta. This is probably one of the most common bacterial causes of abortion. And the only thing you can do is try to avoid, you know, anything that's gonna cause an abscess. Leptos leptospira, leptospirosis. Um, we're gonna talk about it kind of in the second part of this discussion this evening. Remarkably, we see very little leptospirosis in the upper plains. Um, I don't know about Missouri, it can be regionally more prevalent. You know, I do work <clears throat> from all over the country and I still don't see a lot of lepto. I conclude uh, the vaccination procedures for lepto must be pretty efficient. Listeria associated with silage. I'm going to spend a little time with bacillus. It's kind of my favorite bug these days. Campylobacter, E. coli, salmonella. These are all bugs that live in the gut of the cow and occasionally they wander out of the intestine into the bloodstream. 
often associated kind of with high stress um, events. Fungal agents, Aspergillus, Mucor, Obsidia, these are all just environmental, environmental uh, fungal agents. Aspergillus, Aspergillus fumigatus is probably the most common uh, fungus we deal with. This bug is kind of, when you're sitting there looking at your hay and thinking it's kind of moldy, well, it probably is kind of moldy and this very well may be the bug that's gonna, gonna cause you some problems. Uh, IBR, BVD, uh, amazingly, along with Lepto. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about them later, but these are kind of the uh, the old school bugs. Um, you know, we've had pretty much universal vaccination programs for IBR, BVD, and leptospirosis uh, for a lot of years. And, you know, you can argue with uh, the drug companies and who, who's is best, but the reality is they all must be doing something because the, the incidence of these diseases have dramatic, dramatically declined. Neospora, uh, Neospora canine like protozole agent. Uh, to be honest, there was, was a time when I wouldn't have even bothered talking about this to, to, to beef producers. Uh, Neospora probably first discovered almost uh, 27, 28 years ago. I, I diagnosed one of the first cases in Washington State um, as a, predominantly a dairy cow problem, but it's actually, for better or for worse, we're starting to see it show up in beef herds. And it's uh, because of kind of the way we manage beef herds. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, this is probably the number one thing I deal with as far as cause of abortion. Uh, we're talking a common environmental flora. I, I call them dirt bugs. These are bugs that live in the dirt. They live in decomposing vegetable matter. Um, kind of very wimpy, boring pathogens. I don't, you, you really kind of struggle even using pathogens. Um, associated with uh, kind of hit and miss sporadic late-term abortion, stillbirths, and weak-born calves. That continuum I talked about. Lesions are often present only in the placenta. So these are the, that late-term abortion looks kind of normal or that stillborn cow, calf that, you know, what the heck was, why didn't it breathe? Or that weak-born calf that you mess with for eight or 10 hours and then it dies. Uh, it is a mild multifocal necrosuffer placentitis. I showed you that placenta picture where the dark spots, I mean, that is the lesion and it, and it is not everywhere. It's just a mild, it, it affects certain areas of the placenta. Occasionally you'll see a fetal pneumonia where that the bugs have left the placenta either through the bloodstream or actually even into the amniotic fluid in the calf uh, can inhale the bugs. So the risk factor for these wimpy bug, dirt bug abortions, um, basically it's processing, bale processing. We did not see these organisms until probably 25 years ago, 30, maybe 30 years ago, when in this part of the world, when we first started seeing uh, tub grinders show up, and then we started seeing feed wagons, and then we started seeing bale processors, and then we started taking the bale processors and the feed wagons and feeding large groups of cattle out on the ground. Um, feeding, you know, TMR, TMR rations where you take those round bales with that four inches of decomposed hay on the bottom, you throw it into that vertical mixer wagon or you throw it into that tub grinder. All that decomposed material is incorporated directly into the ration. Um, this, the same risk factor actually applies in a, in, you know, to the mycotic, to fungal things, the mycotic things. Uh, dirty corn stover. So years when we've got guys baling corn stalks 
um, and it's dry and the corn stalks are, you know, they're raking them and they're dirty and, I, I, you know, you, you, you can see the dirt in those corn stalk bales. Well, that goes into the wagon, it goes into the tub grinder. Um, so basically it's a, it's an increased exposure to these very kind of lowly pathogenic bugs. These are, these are, they, they take a long time to kill. They go in and damage little spots of the placenta. Uh, it's not a fulminating, I'm gonna kill you in a day kind of an infection. Um, I, oh, hold on here. So back, just another quick picture of what that lesion looks like. So that may be a little dark, those dark areas, that may just be, you know, maybe one here and then another one, you know, in a different section of the placenta. Very, very focal, very multifocal. Um, you know, we've dealt with these probably for 15 years up here. Probably you guys have them down there. I mean, I've, I've had cases from Missouri, so. Uh, I don't know. I never, I never have gotten a figure if, if your beef producers are constantly, are they using feed wagons, processing everything up here? Everybody processes something with a wagon or a tub grinder or bale processors. Um, you, when I recommend to these producers, you know, they want to do something. This is a really nagging, you know, five to seven percent abortion rate problem. Um, you know, I tell them, you know, first try not to feed on the ground. And if you're going to feed on the ground, hopefully you got some snow. You know, so if you've got, you know, the ground's covered with snow and you kind of move around, you can sort of get away with it. Now, the problem with feeding on the ground is not only like this year, we've got some open ground. So those cows will go out there, they'll take that process ration and they'll slick up every little bit of it, including a good healthy dose of dirt on the ground. The other problem you have with feeding on the ground is the cows are not necessarily housebroken. So they're gonna feed you know, along those lines of feed and then they're gonna defecate all around it. So you do, you, you have problems with exposure to fecal material also causing abortion. Feeding spoiled roughage, um, you know, anybody that's fed round bales, especially if they were twine tied, you know, have that four to, you know, have that whole bottom layer of decomposing hay if they're stored on the ground. If it's a wet year, you got more, you got more spoilage. Uh, even with net wrap, you're still going to get, you know, some decomposed bottoms just from the wicking up of moisture from the ground. Um, We found out by kind of accident, you know, we, we concluded that these are wimpy bugs. We, we kind of postulated that what if we were to introduce some feed grade antibiotic, a tetracycline, probably using just label doses, you know, that last trimester. So pulse it, maybe uh, pulse it for a week, stay off for two weeks and pulse it again. Um, what we actually found is that it was a, you know, you'd see the, the abortions kind of disappear. You might, what happened as you were starting to get some effect from the antibiotic, it seems like the abortions slipped over to maybe still a few stillborns, but then all of a sudden, maybe the stillborns started being weakborns. And then hopefully, you know, the weakborns turned into, you know, at least, decent calves. Um, the, the goal with the antibiotic was to prevent, you know, to slow down the damage to the placenta, kill these bugs, slow the damage to the placenta, and hopefully buy enough time for that fetus to, to reach uh, parturition. Uh, this is all, was, was, <laughs> was all good, finding good until the veterinary feed directive. And so the, the challenge producers have now is that there is no label uh, claim for any of this. Um, 
it's just one of those things that accidentally happens to work for this this group of bugs. Um, you know, I have producers still using it. I I suspect the veterinarians are finding you know ways to use these products. You know, maybe kind of gee, that cow looks like she's got a snotty nose, kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> I think. I think a lot of cows up here were getting treated for anaplasmosis periodically, which to be honest, that's above my pay grade. So I, I'm just telling you that it, back in the day when this was easy to do, it, it worked. Um, switching into the other thing that often comes along with some kind of marginal feed stuff. So mycotic abortions, fungal abortions, um, Mycotic abortion versus mycotoxins. So most producers and the whole pile of veterinarians really have a tough time keeping these two separate. So a mycotoxin is a, is a toxic metabolite produced by the fungus or the mycotic agent. Um, there's lots of mycotoxins. I don't think we even begin to understand, you know, what fungus could potentially produce what mycotoxin under what conditions. Um, mycotoxins I primarily deal with in, in swine. Uh, mycotoxins are a lot more challenging to my, monogastric, you know, single, simple stomached animals. Uh, mycotoxins by their nature are actually a protein. And so ruminants have a whole rumen full of bacteria that are actually pretty good at breaking down proteins. So while, while some mycotoxins are, are tough on ruminants, uh, the mycotoxin itself is rarely the problem. It's the mycotic agent with the fungal agent that we, we deal with in abortion diseases. Uh, mycotoxins can, you know, they can have a, they can uh, affect feed intake, immune system function, um, but for the most part, they're a bigger problem in swine than they are in ruminants. Um, you got a whole bunch of hay like that, sell it to the neighbor, um, probably don't feed it. Um, Aspergillus species. Uh, predominantly Aspergillus fumigatus is a white mold. Um, you get a whole plethora of different fungal agents. Um, kind of sometimes hard to put some of these together. You, you need to be able to isolate the organism in large numbers. You need to have compatible lesions. And guess what? The lesions are always in the placenta. So sometimes these can present diagnostic challenges. Um, these are often sporadic, but if you're feeding a lot of moldy hay or a moldy silage or, uh, you know, they can, these mycotic abortions can pile up. Uh, we've been seeing quite a few of them uh, this last month. Uh, fungal spores from the, from the moldy, uh, Feed stuff is ingested or inhaled, it gets into the bloodstream, and voila, it ends up in the placenta. It's a fairly straightforward pathogenesis. And here's what they look like. And so these picture this, you know, you can kind of see the red dark cotyledons, the spores uh, lodge, you know, the bloodstream, they, they lodge in those cotyledons. And then that fungus grows outward, and eventually it'll it'll damage the cotyledon and then fill in uh, all the spaces in between. When you see a when you see a, a placenta like this, it's it's an obvious diagnosis. The only the only thing left is to figure out which fungus it is. Uh, easy, you know, we can grow them, we can stain and look at for them under uh, a microscope. You know, the problem with mycotic abortion is there's not much you can do, nothing you can do after the fact. And oftentimes, it's a challenge 
even if you know what you're dealing with, you know, to, to be able to uh, affect feed quality changes um, when you're already in late gestation. You know, a lot of times these these fungal agents are already at the placenta, they're already growing, um, may not be anything you're gonna do to stop it. Obviously prevention, you know, everybody wants to have perfect feed stuffs. Uh, you know, I would recommend if possible, you know, to avoid feeding the really bad stuff to anything that's pregnant. Uh, Neospora, kind of a new bug. I, as I told, uh, said earlier, once upon a time, I would have told you it was primarily a dairy cattle thing. Out west in the dairy country in Washington state, we used to see this in, in large abortion storms in the big dairies. Um, you know, the, anywhere from 10 to 20% of the at-risk pregnant cows in any given herd could uh, abort over a 30-day period. And basically that would be a, you know, what we call a point source exposure to the agent. Uh, at those times, we didn't have a clue what the agent was or how it worked. Uh, we, we did a lot of work to figure that out. Uh, the organism is shed in, in feces from canines. And it's not raccoons, it's not possums, it's not, you know, your wife's cat. It, it's canines. Um, and and so the the feed, the feed materials in the big dairies out west, you know, the big commodity bays, you know, the rats would hang around the commodity bays. The coyotes would come in to kill the rats, leave a little bit of a present in the in the commodity bay. The coyote had been, you know, the, the, the dairyman had been throwing his aborted fetuses out on the dead pile, which happened to be right there behind the, the commodity shed. The coyote ate the, the aborted fetus, got infected with the organism. The organism completes the life cycle in the dog, uh, sheds the infective stage in the feces back to the cow. Um, it, it's kind of a complex life cycle. It's a lot like, it's a lot like coccidia. Um, abortion storms, weak born calves, uh, kind of the, the five to seven month age gestational fetus is probably the most common. Uh, we, we, we believe that it was kind of in associated with intensive management dry lots. Dry lots by nature often entail uh, intensive feeding. So you're feeding TMRs through feed wagons. And and in reality, what we kind of learned was that yeah, you're 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 feeding in feed wagons. The you know the loader picks up the contaminated feed, throws it into the feed wagon. Uh, voila, you can you know infect that whole group of cows with one batch of feed. Uh, we noticed out west that you know uh, when we were doing epidemiology that you might have one certain string of cows. Uh, having an abortion problem when you when you went to look you know that string of cows might have been the the cows that were being fed uh pizza crust you know out west they feed like any kind of a commodity and only the cows getting pizza crust were aborting well we didn't think genos was intentionally causing cows to abort but then when you kind of look at the data you Kind of speculate that's the that was the feed that was contaminated. Um, these um, grossly you don't see anything. Uh, the lesions in the brain are the most typical. You'll see little spots in the brain uh, that are just little dead spots, and that's where where the infective uh, infective stage of the the protozoal parasite lands. It, it lands in a a folk a little single spot and kills that area. There's cells that come in. Um, fairly easy diagnosis to make microscopically. We can stain them. If you look at the a little bit, I hopefully you can see it on the right. Uh, the the little bit of pink, pink or red staining material. That's the the O's, the uh, thick walled cyst. And all the little dots are the little baby zoites that came out of that cyst. Um, so, why do you think 
we see this now in beef herds. Well, in, in the upper Midwest, upper plains, uh, pretty much vast majority of, of all our beef producers are all feeding cows just identical to the way dairies feed them. Uh, you know, they may not completely be in dry lots, although they, they may, uh, you know, they may be out on corn stalks, but they're pretty much somebody's feeding, often feeding a TMR ration. And so with this disease, that, that, that mixing of contaminated feedstuffs seems to be the key. Now, people ask me all the time, well, we can, you know, why all it feeds round bales? How am I having Neospora? Well, you know, somewhere in my vast collection, I've got a picture of uh, actually from my own bale yard, not 50 yards from the house with the coyotes standing on top of my round bales. So it, uh, you know, the, the contaminated feedstuffs is the key. Uh, managing it's, you know, often challenging, you know, of how you handle those aborted fetuses, you know, you know, dispose of them, bury them, burn them, uh, try not to let, you know, the dog, how the family dog or the neighborhood coyote eat them. Uh, problem with Neospora, is that once infected, that cow is likely to be infected for quite a while. And then if she goes on, she's infected and she goes on to have a live calf, which is good, but that live calf will also be infected for life. So then it then it you know presents a challenge for you and your banker. You know, if you go in and start testing cows in an infected herd, what do you do with all the positives? Uh, you know, I recommend, you know, in a, in a herd, recommend maybe testing the calf, calves that are born. Then, you know, if you've got positive calves, you know, don't, don't save them for your replacement. Um, Neospora kind of seems to be like a, a stress disease. And out West, we kind of spent a lot of time trying to understand that stress component. Um, you know, concurrent infection, you know, seemed to be a good thing to trigger a, an abortion storm with Neospora. The mycotoxins, I talked a little bit about those, uh, could trigger a Neospora abortion storm. There was previously a vaccine. Um, it didn't last very long. Uh, protozoa are phenomenally difficult to make a vaccine. Uh, against, and I was pretty sure it wouldn't make it very long, and it didn't. So now I, I kind of we're, we're switching gears a little bit, and I I put this in because I, you know, there's no producer around that doesn't know IBR, BVD, and Lepto. But I would start this little part of the presentation by. You know, the, these really are, everything I talked about up until this point is what I deal with predominantly on a day-to-day -day basis. IBR, BBD, lepto, I still diagnose them, but it, it's not anywhere near the prevalence uh, we used to have. Um, herpes viruses, you know, has caused a respiratory disease, reproductive disease, genital infections. Um, worldwide, that being said, there's pretty much also, at least in the developed world, worldwide vaccination programs. Uh, herpes viruses can be latent infections. It's kind of a, it's, it's an interesting scientific anomaly, but it very seldom has anything to do with reproductive failure, or for that matter, re respiratory disease with IBR viruses. Um, back in the day, and I've got pictures of my collection of uh, my entire necropsy floor filled with aborted fetuses from, from IBR. This is back before IBR uh, vaccination was ubiquitous. Um, these are usually second half of gestation abortions. Um, 
susceptible cattle. What I mean by that is cattle that have never been vaccinated. I mean, and to be honest, that is a rare event anymore to find cattle that have not been vaccinated for IVR. Cows are usually not sick. Uh, they'll, um, you know, they, they get it usually infected by coming in contact with another cow that's shedding. Uh, IVR is probably one of the easiest things I do microscopically. There's these, the, the slide on the right, the top one, I'm sure you all, everybody recognizes that as a piece of liver. Uh, all those little purple dots in the middle, that's just dead liver. And then if you look at the slide right below it, that's the same whole, that same piece of dead liver stained with a reagent that causes the virus to turn, you know, kind of a candy apple, uh, candy apple green. So it, it's, it's a really straightforward diagnosis. Um, got a lot of tools to diagnose it. That being said, with vaccination, I almost never diagnose it. We've, we've got all kinds of vaccination products, open cows, modified lives, uh, even today, uh, you know, there, there's so many different options, um, you know, to vaccinate these critters. Killed vaccine, live vaccines, for IBR, it really doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Um, the bottom point here, vaccine-induced abortions. To be honest, this is what I see or what we have seen recently uh, when, when some of the vaccine companies started uh, approving using modified live va virus vaccines in pregnant animals, um, we started seeing vaccine-induced IBR abortions. Now the, the vaccine company's label says those cows need to be fully immune to IBR before they receive that vaccine while they're pregnant. Uh, you and I both know if you're buying cows at a sale barn, you haven't got a clue what the immune status of that cow is. So that, to be honest, is what we see primarily with IBR today. We, we may see one or two cases of, of wild type IBR, uh, but last four or five years, most of them have been vaccine induced. BVD um, probably has about as convoluted of, of nomenclature. You've got biotypes and genotypes. The biotypes, non-cytopathic and cytopathic BVD, genotypes one and two, and I think there's actually a two, uh, you know, some subtypes of two now. Um, infection and immunocompetent cattle. So these are normal cattle usually will have mild subclinical disease um, ranging all the way up to you know severe hemorrhagic mucosal disease, hemorrhagic syndromes um, the placenta is is uh, BVD virus's favorite place to go hang out it, it gets there in a hurry the the reproductive effects of BVD um, are, are phenomenally complicated and it's based on you know the gestational age of the fetus when that infection occurs and I wanted to kind of go through that really quickly most of you probably have you know kind of heard some of these things most of the virus we deal with is a type 2 non-cytopathic BVD virus for what that's worth um, early exposure of the fetus embryonic mortality pretty straightforward uh, the fetus is going to die. 45 to 125 days, roughly in there, a non cytopathic BVD produces what we refer to as a persistently infected animal. And those are probably one of the biggest challenges we have dealing with BVD in our cow herds. Um, the fetus is not immunologically uh, competent. The virus takes up resident in the fetus. Um, you can also see some congenital defects at this age. Um, little older calves, 
with BVD uh, is when you see all the congenital anomalies. Uh, the long list of things. Um, you you look at a brain on a cerebellar hypoplasia calf. The top picture. Um, I'm sure you all know your your brain anatomy, but there's the big bilobed area, which is the cerebrum. Right behind that is where the cerebellum is supposed to live, and and there's nobody home. So anyway, infection during this stage kind of gives you. You know, these congenital anomalies. If I'm looking at a fetus, I don't see, you know, I take the brain out and I don't see a cerebellum. Uh, it's pretty straightforward what we're dealing with. The bottom calf is what we call a hypotrichosis calf. So this is a calf that should be fully haired and obviously it's missing about, well, it's missing pretty much all its hair. Um, virus versus immune response to the virus. Um, it's a battle at this stage. You know, does a virus cause the damage or does a calf's ability to fight the virus win? And, and so it's a battle. The outcome's kind of unpredictable. Um, once they get out to 175 days, often the immunocompetent fetus uh, can fight that infection, although there is reports of increased mortality in these late virus infected calves. I'm uh, not going to go into a lot of BVD vaccine things. You know all the all the all the options. If you don't, there's more than one veterinarian or drug salesman that'll spend lots of quality time. I avoid vaccine discussions. I get asked all the time, and I essentially refuse to get into it because there's I cannot weigh in on a vaccine without getting myself in trouble. Um, Modified lives killed pre-breeding vaccination during gestation. There's lots of options. The reality is, for the most part, cattle producers have vaccination programs. Uh, you know, products. The companies fight that out. They spend millions of dollars a year trying to to convince you that you know their product is best. Um, vaccination programs must work. This, to some fairly significant degree, because the, you know, the reality is the prevalence of this uh, disease has dropped substantially. It's still out there, and the vaccine manufacturer will remind you that it's still out there. Uh, but um, you know, we, we've made great progress with vaccinations. Um, and I get in trouble every once in a while when I say this to no matter whose vaccine I'm talking about, a heavy challenge with BVD will win the battle over everybody, anybody's vaccine. So that's when the, the PI animal we talked about, if you have those PI animals in the herd shedding lots of virus, that's that's when uh, that heavy exposure from the PI animal will pretty much beat out anybody's vaccination program. Uh, you've probably seen some of these slides where a PCR uh, shows up as a diagnostic test. You know, I've done I've done diagnostic medicine for almost 40 years now, and and pretty much everything in viruses and and to some degree, to some bacteria is all PCR based. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. Kind of a <laughs> in, in the in the in the era of a pandemic, every every pretty much everybody's COVID vaccine or COVID virus test is a PCR test. So this is a technology that's essentially ubiquitous in diagnostics on both human and veterinary side. Uh, serologic screening. We do serology for for BVD, but it's it's a challenge because everybody's vaccinated. So you're trying to sort out vaccination reactions versus wild type virus. Uh, killed products often have really elevated antibody titers, where modified lives don't have real high titers, but yet you can argue which one protects. The modified live guys say, well, there's just a is a more natural immunity. I don't get into the discussions. 
uh, detecting PI animals. Uh, that's where we do those ear notches, IHC, PCR. Most important strategy, one is vaccination. Two, make sure you don't get PI animals in your in your herd. And you know, probably still one of the most easy way to get a PI animal is to go out and buy it at the sale barn. A um, little bit on the PI animals, in utero infection, non-cytopathic, prior to immunocompetence, these animals will continuously shed virus forever. Um, high, high mortality rates in the first year. PI dams produce PI offspring. The this, this cycle goes on. Um, if those PI animals are accidentally exposed to a cytopathic virus, all PI, uh, PI animals have a non-cytopathic, but if they're exposed to a cytopathic variant of BVD, that's when you're going to see the really devastating mucosal diseases. Um, several years back, I uh, worked with a herd, um, fairly large herd actually, way out west. Uh, bought, a, bought a whole pile of critters, actually had depopulated their herd, bought a brand new herd back. Lo and behold, they had all kinds of PIs in that herd they bought. Uh, that first year calf crop was an absolute disaster. Uh, had lots of abortions, stillbirths, and then we went in and, and ear notch tested the live born calves and I think 67% of them were PI. So it's one of those diseases while vaccines a really good tool, you, kind of got to be careful with the rest of your management procedures. Um, finishing off the, the last of the used to be famous abortion diseases. Uh, I'm not even, you know, it's a, the test for the night is if you can pronounce all that stuff on the top line. Leptospira, uh, leptoharjo, you really feel brave. It's leptoharjo bovis. That's the species of lepto that we see in cattle. It's host adapted for cattle. If, if, lepto, if lepto harjo would not exist if not for cattle. The other species, most of you are probably familiar, lepto vaccines kind of come as a five way. Uh, different serovars maintained in different species and different uh, wildlife species. Um, Serologically, there appears to be a lot of lepto in, in around the world. Um, the, the reality in the Upper Plains, and I would assume to some degree, maybe a lot of Missouri, we don't see a lot of lepto. Matter of fact, the last lepto I diagnosed was in a horse. So uh, we just, you know, we test every abortion case for lepto by PCR technology. Uh, we don't see it. Transmission direct, um, usually like urine or or potentially other fluids. Um, basically, you introduce lepto often into the into the herd with a carrier animal, a contaminated water supplies. Um, you know, the, the carrier animal could be a rat or some other species. Pig pig guys have historically back in the old days used to have a lot of trouble with rats in the in the pig barn those rats would carry lepto and you know, that's where they would get their their uh, lepto problems uh, kind of like everything else basically PCR is the, the test this used to be really a challenge to diagnose uh, you would take compression smears of a fetal kidney and you would uh, stain them with a fluorescent reagent and you would spend uh, many quality hours in a dark little room looking for little bacteria that glow in the dark. Um, not not fun. Serology, serology it, it's kind of a straightforward test, but it's kind of like the rest of the serology testing we do. I don't really recommend it for a single cow. You know, if you got a cow that aborts, you know, bleed her if you want to, save the serum. You know, if you have another one or two abort, then We'll look at the whole group. 
compare aborts versus uh, non-abort controls and see if you can uh, tell any difference. Serovar Harjo, Harjo bovis in cattle, even in the face of vaccine, most cows rarely zero convert to this. So you'll bleed them and lo and behold, they'll be negative or really low for for for, for zero bar harjo and actually most of the other ones. So it's it's one of those vaccines that I can't prove serologically. It looks like it works, but uh, from an epidemiologic standpoint on the numbers of abortions associated with lepto, I, I conclude it must work. Uh, we played around for a while using serology on the fetal uh, fetal fluids, like fetal heart blood or fetal thoracic blood. And these these animals, back when we used to see lepto, they the fetal fluids would be positive. Uh, vaccination, kind of already hit on that. Antibiotics. Once upon a time, back in the old days, they would use antibiotics, and they were these were back when we had good antibiotics. Uh, one of the drugs of choice was was streptomycin, which we haven't had streptomycin for quite a while. Uh, zoonotic risks, uh, lepto was kind of a big deal, uh, especially a lot of times for slaughterhouse workers. So if you're in the if you're on the line and and somehow you're going to get exposed to some urine from some of these cows, the, the urine would often have lepto in it or the birth fluids from a old cold cow would have lepto in it. So we've kind of gone over a little bit. Most of you probably have already had enough for the night. Um, some take-home things, abortion, stillborn, weak born. Think of it as a continuum. Think of it as different stages of, or different outcomes based on the stages of placental damage. Uh, interventions that maintain placental function. I'm kind of referring, you know, the, to some of the work we've done with just boring bacteria and, and uh, pulsing some antibiotics. Vaccination protocols. Um, you, you basically have to conclude they've been successful in controlling, for the most part, IBR, BVD, and lepto. I mean, they're still out there, uh, but it's. It, uh, you know, not to, not, let's, let's just go with, we've induced pretty dang good herd immunity to these organisms. Um, opportunistic pathogens are probably the most common thing we deal with today. These would be the opportunistic bugs like uh, tuparella that causes abscesses, bacillus, the funguses, um, enteric bugs, you know, from con fecal contaminated feed. Those are, those are what I deal with on a daily basis. And then finally, diagnosis of these diseases. And, and you producers, now you might find this hard to believe, but I'm gonna almost guarantee the veterinarian's gonna send you a bill for a submission. And I think it, you know, it behooves everybody involved in the process to, to try to do uh, the best job and submit the best uh, sample possible. All right, I think we're ready for any questions. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry that went a little long. But... No, that's all right. That was very good information. Um, so, so I do have a few questions, and I would remind anybody that's listening, uh, if they have a question after Dr. Holler's presentation, please put that in the chat function, and uh, we'll ask a few questions here um, before we conclude for the evening. So, uh, Dr. Holler, you're talking a lot about uh, feedstuffs. Um, th there's, there's been a, a, a trend towards a, a lot more putting up uh, haylage, let's say. Right. Okay. And, and especially round bale haylage. Okay. Um, what have you seen? Have you seen any kind of causative effects with that? Uh, of course, you get a lot of white, you get a lot of molds with baleage uh, in general. I get a lot of questions on white molds um, in particular. Have you seen any causative effects from uh, that sort of a feed stuff? It's always a dose steal. It's a dose response. The more, the more mold, the more the risk. 
um, you know, never having moldy feed stuff. So I, I'm, you know, when I first started feeding with a, you know, a vertical feed wagon, you know, you'd pick up the bale and you'd look at it and you'd kind of close your eyes and throw it in the wagon as fast as you could. Cause once it was in the wagon, it kind of, it looks a lot better after it's spun around for 10 minutes. Um, the baleage is kind of, I mean, it's, it's a silage with covered up in plastic. Um, it's going to grow mold pretty much anywhere where it's going to get enough oxygen to grow mold. Um, you know, the better, the quicker they're baled or bat, you know, wrapped, probably the better. Um, you know, it's a good feed store source. Is it drastically higher risk than other things? No. I mean, it, it, it is what it is. There's not, you know, you're, if that's, that's what you're committed to using, you're not going to look at that and say, gee, there's a little mold on that. I'll throw that one away. You know, it's the same thing I deal with, with the producer that, you know, I've diagnosed aspergillosis and, you know, we've concluded that it's 200 tons of silage he's got piled out there has got mold on it. Well, he goes, well, what am I going to do? And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you're not going to throw away 200 tons of silage. You know, maybe throw the stuff along the edges away. You know, the, you know and, and trust me, you're going to have more trouble at the end of the silage season than you will at the beginning of the silage season. But you know, it's 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 one of those things where you can know your risk factors and try your best to, to mitigate. If you got some that's got your your baleage has got a little bit of mold, well, maybe you can find some dry hay that's got a little less mold. You know, blend it. You know, reduce the exposure. Um, you know, I've had years where there just aren't options. You're feeding whatever you got, and you're dang glad you've got it. So it's. Right. It's all in the nature of raising livestock. Uh, another question that came in, um, if a cow aborts during her pregnancy, what would be your recommendation as far as keeping that individual versus an automatic trip to the, to the sale barn? Um, Often that's a economic question instead of an infectious disease question. How bad do you want to keep her over? and rebreed her and feed her for another, you know, nine months. The reality is, you know, depending, you know, there may not be really any real risk factors for the next pregnancy, but it, you know, economically, it just, you know, does it make sense to, to keep her around, breed her, feed her, another, you know, a lot of factors come into play, including what the banker thinks. So yeah, there's not very few in abortion diseases. You know, a, an abortion is not necessarily a kiss of death, unless economically it makes more sense to get rid of her and and not hold her over for the whole time. Sure. Um... So we had a couple questions come in about recommend, recommended vaccine protocols or uh, even kind of towards the use of a multivalent vaccine. Um, what, you know, what might be your thoughts um, on a recommended vaccination protocol? I know you, you're, you're probably not going to go out and endorse it. I, I already said I wasn't going out on that limb. Yep. It's, it's um, usually they kind of have to yeah the problem i have with making anybody's recommendation is i get in trouble because you know it's it's you can probably get a couple beers in me and probably get me to start talking but um you know the reality is the best person for that is is the veterinarian they're going to be working with and you know they they've got to have a certain trust now I get a lot of veterinarians call me up and, you know, start asking kind of sort of questions. And, you know, if they kind of keep questions, you know, more generic, you kind of work through them. But the reality is that, you know, most products are, you know, good. Some people love the modified loves. Some people like the killed. And, you know, if you want to get in an argument, you know, you start talking about just 
that fact alone. Um, so I've kind of, <laughs> I, I really don't know I have a strong answer for it. I mean, they, the, the reality is they need to work with somebody that knows their herd, knows their management styles, uh, you know, uh, as far as specific vaccine products, specific vaccination strategies. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, without me knowing all the details and being their veterinarian, it's, it's almost impossible to say. You know, the killed vaccines, wow. If you look at, if you look at a killed vaccine based on what its ability to, to elicit an antibody response, wow. Um, Fire Shield, I think Fire still, you know, back when it was Grand Labs Fire Shield, uh, I don't know what that adjuvant was in there, but it it would be, it was the only vaccination protocol that stimulated an immune response, at least an antibody response that I could measure with my test as high as an actual infection. Matter of fact, I couldn't tell the difference between actual infections and antibody responses to virus shield, especially, you know, especially to BVD. That being said, that doesn't really mean anything to protect it. It means that stimulate whatever adjuvant is in that product was a good adjuvant. So, you know, they got to, they got to kind of work with their veterinarians and veterinarians for the most part are, they're, they're not even remotely bashful to weigh in on these discussions. I kind of work for a lot of different veterinarians and a lot of different, you know, do a lot of work for a lot of drug companies. So, you know, I kind of stay out of it safer that way. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I can understand that. Um, did have a question come in and, you know, we get this from time to time, especially when it gets uh, dry in, uh, in northern Missouri um, about blue tongue and uh, what have you seen in the past concerning uh, blue tongue infections causing uh, abortion storms, if you will? We don't see a, a lot of blue tongue up in our neighborhood. So you're farther south. So Helicoides is going to be around. Um, you know, the, the blue tongue and cattle story is kind of a you know, it's been a it's been an interesting one over the years. I was actually at Wyoming and did a lot with the arthropod born blue tongue group, um, you know, and was indirectly involved with some of the work on blue tongue and bovine abortion and blue tongue and congenital anomalies in cattle. I, uh, I think it can, you know, obviously cause some reproductive failure. I don't you know, you guys would probably know better than I do. You know, we don't see a lot of it. Um, occasionally, probably the more, what we see more up here is we'll actually, and I don't know, you guys might actually have some of the same problem. I haven't visited with any colleagues down there, but uh, uh, EHD, epizootic hemorrhagic disease, which is a really closely related uh, virus. Uh, Occasionally, when we get really, really dry up here in EHD, we get an EHD outbreak in the deer population, we'll see that spill over into our cattle. Not necessarily, hardly anything reproductively involved, but we'll, we'll see some cows get sick. You know, if the cow is a kind of in poor shape to begin with, you know, we've had some, some mortalities associated with EHD. So these, these insect-borne uh, viruses are, are interesting. I don't, yeah. Do you guys have a lot of blue tongue associated reproductive disease down there or just blue tongue in general? It's a lot harder on sheep than it is on cattle. Than on yeah. so, so I would say um, you have pockets of it um, okay. and, and whether it actually is or not, but it, a lot of times it gets blamed. Uh, well, I mean, that, that the, the data is actually very inconclusive. I, when we were at, when I was at Wyoming, we were doing some of that work and there was some preliminary data that looked kind of bad that it was maybe causing more problems and congenital anomalies. And, and, and a lot of that work actually from the ARS group had to, a lot of it was retracted because some of the experiments, they had a few variables in the experiment they didn't know they had in the experiment. So it, it 
BVD and or blue tongue and re reproductive disease, I think is, I won't argue that some people think it's there, but I'm not sure it's always, it's always confirmed. We don't do, routinely we do no screening for, for blue tongue. Occasionally we'll do some EHD work if, if all the pieces fit together, you know, we're in August and September at a drought and, you know, we start seeing some some lesions on the nose and stuff with some of these cattle and just we're doing lameness and stuff like that. So. so I, I I probably saved one of the more contentious questions to last. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, you know, question, you kind of alluded to it actually in your presentation about, uh, you know, when antibiotic use was a little less right. restrictive than it is today. Um, ha have you seen maybe an increase in, in reproductive failures since uh, antibiotic use, say, in, in minerals um, has, has gone down? Um, you know, it's an all I can give is an impression. And so, the, especially with these opportunistic wimpy, wimpy bugs, I think I've, even this year, I think I'm seeing an uptick. Um, is, you know, the, the challenge now is I have no idea how much antibiotic is still making its way into these cows. There's ways to get around it. Um, and I don't know, I, and I don't ask, and I don't intentionally start the discussion in a proactive way. If I, if I mention it, I mention it in the good old days, we used to, you know, that discussion, um, because most all these people have, I've had that discussion with them before, so it's not you know, it, it, when we started seeing these uptick in some of these wimpy bugs, you know, the, and back when we could legally do it, there was, you know, there was a lot of folks that felt like they had some fairly good success with it. Medically, I think it makes, it makes sense, but, you know, it was one, it's one of those that you're not going to convince any manufacturer to do a, an extensive clinical trial to get that added onto, you know, OxyTet's label. You just, they're just not going to spend the money. So do we, do we miss it? Yeah, I think maybe a little, I don't know. You know, we're, we're, we're operating in a whole new era. So uh, antibiotic therapy is, uh, antimicrobial use is, is huge now. I spend a, way too much of my time involved with uh, ongoing research on uh, antimicrobial resistance. I mean, it's just, and it's, and it's only getting worse. You know, we, we, we do a lot of testing for antimicrobial resistance and there's a whole lot more people interested in the data we find. And, you know, there are trends that are scary. You know, I don't argue that. Now I would argue is there a direct correlation between some of the data we're finding and some of the concerns that my colleagues on the human side are feeling? I, I'm not convinced. I, I, to be honest, I think they do a crappy job using antimicrobials on the human side. Um, so I don't, not sure we can take all the blame, but the, but the reality is the discussion has started and and it's not going away. It's not going away anytime soon. And at the at the end of the day, I'm very fearful. You know where agriculture will come out. And so you know that's kind of you know we're involved in the discussions. You know I'm I'm kind of a believer, not necessarily wasn't wasn't always but i've kind of become a little bit of a believer at least judicious use you know knowing what you're using and why you're using it and 
you know, not just using it because it's in the refrigerator and you know how to work a syringe. So yeah, we pretty much all our lamps, you know, in our in our sheep operation, ninety five percent of our lambs are all marketed antibiotic free. You know, when we started down that road, I figured, you know, Armageddon was coming and knock on wood, you know, we made some fairly simple management changes and I don't feed any, feed any tetracycline pre-lambing. We used to do that all the time. And so, you know, we're learning, we're learning to adapt, you know, and I think that, you know, basically what cattle producers are, are doing with antimicrobials, there's, there's still some real challenges, you know, in cattle production, the, the respiratory disease complexes, how to use, how to use these antibi antibiotics, the, the organisms and, you know, the resistance patterns and timing and metaphylaxis and it's kind of an ugly can of worms once you start opening it. Sure. Kind of a loaded question there for you two to end the evening <laughs> on. Well, it, it's, it's, it's a real one. I mean, I'm on, I don't even know how many different American Association of Veterinary Lab Laboratory Diagnosticians. You know, we we collect all this data of, of antimicrobial resistance. My lab does that. You know, and I I'm impressed how many different entities are interested in that data now. Uh, we've actually got private producer groups, private producers. You know, big. You know, we're talking big production units. That are they're monitoring and keeping their own antimicrobial resistance data. They want to know, you know, I've got an E. coli in this calf today, and got another one a month from now, and another one ten years or five years from now. I want to know, is there can we document a trend of change in antimicrobial resistance? So. Yeah, that's a story that uh, continues to be written. Oh, it's not going away. Not going away. And you, it, it probably it, it isn't going away in my lifetime, and I doubt it'll go away in yours. I'm sure that is probably right. Well, Dr. Holler, uh, I, I don't see any more questions from the audience, so um, I think we'll we'll probably go ahead and conclude this for this evening. So. We want to thank you uh, for coming back and uh, you had some great information there and hopefully uh, everybody that's watching got uh, something to take home from that. And uh, we want to thank all of our sponsors again for the Missouri Livestock Symposium and remind everybody uh, uh, that's watching that uh, at least for a while yet, uh, you can go to MissouriLivestock.com and catch all the past recorded uh, sessions and we've got uh, a couple left before we uh, conclude the virtual Missouri Livestock Symposium uh, the end of this month. So uh, again, Dr. Holler, thank you very much uh, for your time and for your information uh, this year and uh, we uh, wish you to stay safe and stay warm and uh, <laughs> uh, happy lambing season coming up. All right. Take care everyone.